Hi, this is Alan Gassman, and I'm so glad to be here with so many friends that you've attended our Saturday webinars showing a terrible lack of taste. And uh, <laughs> I was not able to get Elton John. I, I do apologize for that. I <laughs> promised Elton John. And Elton John's uh, nephew was also unavailable. So what I got instead was this guy I met, uh, Chuck Dollenbach. I met him in an airline lounge. He seems all right. And we're going to talk today about success planning. Now, if you came in through CPA Academy, you're going to have to answer four corny polling questions when we get to them. If you uh, did not come in through CPA Academy, then you don't get credit. Unless you're a lawyer from Florida, then let us know. We'll get you credit. If you have questions for Chuck, click on the inverted pyramid and ask him any question you want. Now, I told Chuck, most of you are CPAs, so I've sent you his financial statements and his tax return. <laughs> so if you have any questions on his financial statements or tax returns, you are welcome to answer them. So, uh, Chuck, I want to I want to just kind of give an actual biography of you. And I see that you were born in Wisconsin, but at some point you defected from the United States <laughs> <laughs> to Canada. And that before you struck out in the business world musically, it looks like you had a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in music. And then from scratch, you and a close friend and a wonderful guy, Gene Watts, you on the trombone and Gene, I mean, Gene on the trombone, you on the tuba, just formed a band called the Canadian Brass. And, and then you completely blew out the roof for what a brass <laughs> band, what, for what anyone thought a brass band could do. I mean, you took a machete and you carved out a little path, which <laughs> became a roadway, 60 countries, 130 record albums and still going strong now when i explained all that to elton john he said hey <laughs> i'll go on later let let this guy go on first so and then you've got a killer good team who you have selected trained mentored you have I know from years of experience with you that you have a wonderful relationship with not only your musicians who are top notch and going even further, but also with everyone who's involved with the Canadian brass world, in particular music professors and music teachers throughout the world who are motivated and make use of, of your arrangements, and share with their students the joy of brass instruments. So I didn't mean for this to be like a funeral, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling older already. I don't know. So, so Chuck, we have 55 <laughs> minutes left. Do you want to just take it from here? <laughs> sure. Well, that's a good background. And um, in fact, uh, when I came to Canada, it was a very uh, opportune time. You know, we needed to start building the wall between the United States and Canada, so that was my uh, that was my role. Now, we haven't gotten very far. I think two bricks up, but uh, it was a very uh, important time. 1970 is when I came to to uh, Toronto. It was my first job in life. I was teaching at the University of Toronto. Uh, within the first week, I met Gene Watts, the trombonist you mentioned, and he and I shared a lot of uh, uh, background points and wanted to see what we could do with uh, music that we loved, how we could take that to audiences. So the business component of this is, how do you turn a, a something that's very, um, say, thrilling to us to play music, how do you now make that into something that you can do on a continuing basis and actually make a living doing it? So I think that's uh, kind of where we met, Alan, you and I, back in the day, was trying to figure out how we did make something uh, a viable uh, business concern along with the music. 
So I think that's probably where we, we sort of want to start. Okay. Let's start. What what was in your mind when you were getting these degrees and looked at were you mentored by somebody? Did you model somebody mm -hmm. or what what was your impression of what would happen when you started versus what happened? Well, I'm uh, entrepreneurship is a word that's getting uh, bandied about these days. Colleges are having to create entrepreneur classes and so forth. But really, it's the the uh, the model behavior, what you see, what you can perceive out there. What would you like to be? How would you like to approach the profession? And for us, uh, we saw back when I was in school, we saw a lot of really wonderful musicians, but not much uh, about how to take that great uh, skill and take it out in front of audiences. How do you actually make that that transition? So we were pretty much on our own trying to figure that out. Um, we can get back to this later, but I feel that a lot of the entrepreneur efforts today still are in the same frame. It's uh, it's counseling people how to do the basic peripheral things, but not the, not the main event, how to take your skill forward. At any rate, in 1970, we were on the ground floor of our profession. We, we were all skilled in playing our instruments, but there was no path to follow. Uh, I think in every other profession, or many professions, there is a path to follow. You know what coursework you need to do, what kind of degree you need to have, where you need to apprentice, and then how you become your own uh, entity, either working for someone or working uh, with people. And uh, we saw that there was no path. Now that gave us an opportunity to be more creative perhaps than, than uh, most musicians were, but it also meant that we had to start right at the ground floor. There was no, uh, uh, there was no brass group like us making a full-time living uh, doing what we did. Uh, to be fair, the brass quintet concept started in 1948 in Chicago with members of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And they did it as a pastime. They loved getting together and playing music and they would do a few concerts here and there, but again, not as a profession. So by the time that uh, we had played, we knew that uh, this format existed, the brass quintet, but there was very little repertoire, very little music that, that would really attract an audience. There were a lot of contemporary pieces so we took a masterpiece approach. We thought if we were going to create a repertoire overnight, we might as well do a masterpiece approach and go to the finest composers. So Bach, Handel, Haydn, uh, Mozart, these were our targets. We took the very best and made it our repertoire. And then in the background, we were commissioning works. But commissioning is a, uh, it's a tough journey. They, the possibility of someone writing a piece of music that suddenly becomes famous or important. In fact, we have a little concept. We used to play the, the uh, Packabell Canon, the famous Canon by Johann Packabell. And we pointed out that uh, this piece had more recordings than any other piece in history. Mm. And uh, consequently, the royalties that poured in from this, uh, Packabell is long passed away he's he's 300 years ago so those royalties he saw none of that but his wife is delighted about it she <laughs> saw none of those royalties <laughs> and we also said take a take a page out of Packabell's book if you want to be remembered after you die just write a famous piece so he did he wrote a famous piece and consequently there we have it so we went and looked for all the famous pieces and put it into our repertoire and that gave us the basis to uh, start a concert career. And then it was a matter of uh, simple steps, small steps. Our ambitions were reasonable enough that we could have obtained them. And we just went inch by inch and uh, created what we have now. What, what was your first goal? What was your, what was your survival goal that you were pleased to, to reach? Okay. Well, very uh, at the very start, our hope was we could get to the point we would attract enough interest in what we were doing. We could maybe go out on weekends and play in colleges and universities. 
and uh, maybe some small chamber opportunities. So it was a very small hill. And of course, with small hills, there's always a larger one you see when you get to the top of that one. And then our next goal was if we could actually uh, create recordings that would interest people. And um, we had a lot of support from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation up here in Canada. Um, that's kind of a sad story. If you want to talk about a sad business story, CBC is a shadow of its former self. And um, I don't mind going on record as saying that. It was what connected Canada. Canada, of course, goes from Newfoundland to to British Columbia, but it's a very small band of people that, I don't know, what, 100 miles north of the border, and beyond that, it gets quite quite empty. Now, attaching, making people in British Columbia feel like they're connected to people in Newfoundland is quite a challenge. And the CBC radio, CBC television, uh, did a remarkable job of doing just that. But with um, all these kind of organizations, it got pushed and pulled to the point where it's it, it can it can do very little today. Even though it has a large budget, it's uh, used in different different ways than it used to be. So at any rate, CBC gave us the uh, the uh, platform to reach audiences nationwide before we ever got out of Toronto. And then when we came into the states, which was roughly five years after we started. Hmm. Uh, we were very fortunate in in being picked up by public radio, NPR and so forth. So we started getting a national base in the United States. And then the, uh, the, the moment of truth was when we got to perform a live concert on WQXR, the well-known classical radio station in New York City. One hour a week, they would have a live performance and they invited us to perform live and uh we showed up the day of the performance and we set up our music and got all organized and then we went off for coffee and 10 or 15 minutes before the uh the start of the program these people came rushing in all scared we've been looking all over for you guys they were so nervous and we said you know we've been doing this every just about every day since we started these live performances no, not to worry so we went down and played and that performance was uh was uh, heard by an executive producer at at RCA Recordings, RCA Red Seal, and that led to a, a recording contract that uh, again put us on an international basis. We suddenly had recordings in Germany and London as well as North America, so it was very fortuitous. But all unplanned things, each little step led to something new, exciting, different, something to tackle, to think about, and then led to the, hopefully the next step. And during that time, did you have a day job that you were supporting yourself with, or did this become self-supporting? Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, the Hamilton Orchestra, Hamilton is a, a town about uh, 40 minutes west of Toronto. Hamilton was a steel company and they had a, a, a small orchestra, a community orchestra, probably the best community orchestra in the world. And community was the important part of that. They had what they called the Hamilton plan. And the plan was to take a string group, a brass group, a wooden group, a percussion group into every school in a 60 mile radius uh, during the year and then bring all these kids into a performance of a, of a large orchestra at the end of the year. They achieved the goal in a 30 mile radius before it was dissembled as musicians like to do. But we were the, uh, the tip of that wedge. We were the ones to go into the schools and get them excited about performances. And that led us, uh, I think we're the only musicians in the world that can, can say that uh, we found our way to Carnegie Hall by performing children's concerts. It was a great laboratory for us. Uh, children are very quick to let you know how you're doing. They are great critics. You know within seconds if they're with you or they're not with you. Unlike an adult audience, an adult audience might even give you a standing ovation and just not bother to show up the next year. Children let you know right away. You know if you're on or you're off, and that was a great training ground for us, is how to attract an audience, 
how to uh, get through to an audience, how to present music in a way that would be interesting, recognizing that usually just about everybody in that audience was totally unfamiliar with what we were doing. They might not even know what a trumpet is, much less a French horn or a tuba. So that was our task, how to take a piece by Bach, even the shortest piece by Bach, three, let's say three minutes, is longer than the sesame approved attention span of a child, which is less than a minute. So how do you present a three minute work and get children to listen carefully? And then maybe even the next step, how do you get them to maybe even cheer at the end? Fantastic laboratory for us in those early years. And it's, uh, it's been useful forever, you know, ever since to this day. When you say children, what age? What's well, the other things that you can make that happen? Well, you, we've been told that our audience represents a sitcom audience. That meaning you'll have a a very young child and a, and a great grandfather and then everything in between. Uh, which, by the way, is one of the, uh, if, if there's success in what we've been doing just for longevity, is that at first we had... Uh, well, I'll tell you a little story. We were playing down in in, uh, in uh, Missouri, where our crown bonus was from, and we got to the end of our program. We had questions and answers, and one young fellow raised his hand and said, uh, "Mr. Watts, um, you went to school with my, and you, you know, like you expect mother. You went to school with my grandmother." We thought, "Okay, it has started." <laughs> <laughs> But we did keep these the audience. We, we invariably would meet people after concerts who will bring their children and sometimes grandchildren and say, we heard you in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s and wanted our children to have the same experience. I think that's what's made for a, a successful career is that we are still in touch with our audience totally, top to bottom. And at one point in time, I guess getting in touch with your audience was only record albums and radio, right? Because you couldn't, I mean, there was no internet for them to watch you on YouTube. They, right. That must have been a real, right. must have, how did that work? Well, you probably have read, in fact, everybody watching has probably read all these articles, the pop musicians crying the blues about the, the internet era and how they can't sell records anymore and how it deeply impacted their their uh, earning opportunities. Uh, quite the opposite for us. The internet has been amazing for us. We can watch our s statistics of who's listening. And of course, the United States is the number one. Uh, everybody would expect Canada to be next, which um, it isn't. Uh, next is Germany. Then comes uh, Italy and England, and Italy and England, we perform there very, very seldom. Germany a lot, United States a lot, and then South America. We have a lot of fans. Uh, we have a big fan base in South America, some place that we've, we've only been in South America maybe twice in all these years. So the Internet is very good for, for us and people like us who would not have had another way to reach that audience. So we feel like we're were uh, having great new opportunities with the internet rather than it impacting in, in a negative ways. So you're absolutely right. This internet has changed everything. Used to be we'd, uh, when we first started out, we would put LPs, which by the way, were too big. And oh, by the way, you can just see the corner of our first LP back there. At any rate, Canadian Brass in Paris. <laughs> um, we used to put those in the trunk of our car and drive to a concert, play, and then people would buy them. and we. Our intention then was to break even. We just hoped we could sell enough to break even, knowing that these people took home a small poster. Even if they just set it on a counter, they'd be seeing Canadian brass, and if they played it, all the better. So that was a, a small ambition back then. Now with the Internet, people, Spotify and Apple are our two biggest, of course, two biggest uh, places to find Canadian brass. And uh, there are several things in our repertoire that have become absolutely standard. Uh, Canadian brass is almost synonymous with Christmas, which is great for us. I mean, the sound of brass, it's just perfect for Christmas. And it, it just fits. You play one note and it's sort of that time of year. And then the other uh, thing that's been uh, good for us is 
simply been collections, like best of kinds of recordings, rather than, and, and we've, we've made a Monteverdi album, we made a Bach album, a Chopin album, so forth, specific composers. Those get a little more, um, um, uh, a certain audience might be attracted to a specific album on the music of Brahms, or the music of Bach, but in a collection, that seems to be, again, fortunately for us, that seems to be our audience, is uh, people with really a variety of tastes, just like us. Again, I think that's one of the reasons we got together and did this in the first place. Uh, just for background, a brass player, if you think of all the instruments in the world, by the way, I wanted to mention, I don't want to forget, uh, Elton John is a neighbor of mine now. Is he? Yeah, he's like two blocks away. So wow. Wow. I, 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 I didn't want him to feel there's any disrespect in me taking his place today. <laughs> I didn't get that. Could you try again? Okay, wow. speaking of, I don't know. <laughs> um, speaking of Elton John, now, okay, since I know there's a lot of business people that tune into this because, by the way, I've tuned into your Saturday programs and I always make it through at least 10 minutes and then it gets beyond my my expertise, it's not beyond my interest. When you got into slats, I think you call them slats down there? Yeah. And I, that's when I had to check out. I, <laughs> and we don't have slats up here in Canada. But by the way, we do have some very attractive, if you want to talk about Canadian uh, tax system, we can talk. Because everybody thinks Canada is a terrible place to live because the taxes are so high. But and we can get back to that later. At any rate, the uh, the Canadian brass uh, uh, concept of of um, recordings and the the business around it, uh, we got to the point where our last contract with one of the majors was um, BMG was eighty five pages long. The cover. I'm sure anything that's ever got gone wrong in their in their history, the recording company's history, gets into a contract. And it's just uh, so I became a contract reader. And Alan, as you know very well, I did become a contract reader, and and uh, not necessarily a very good one. I had to keep asking you page by page, well, what does this mean? And can we get these rights back? Usually the answer to that was no. And uh, <laughs> did we sign? Our on page here. Are are you getting some rights back to arrangements and other things as well as back to nineteen six well, nineteen seventy or seventy one, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Well, as you know, um, if if we were to give uh, tips to young, probably any profession, but in music, it's real obvious. Is uh, start publishing anything that you write. First of all, start writing arrangements, compositions, and then start a publishing company. Uh, early on in our first recording, uh, I was tipped off by our recording company. Thank you very much that mechanical rights were due. So every time they sold a record, a certain amount of money had to be paid to the, the owner of the, the music. So I started a publishing company in uh, 1974. At that time, we controlled four titles. And at this point, and I kept the publishing company, that's, that's my main interest other than playing the instrument is the publishing company. I really enjoyed this part of the, the business. At this point, we control over 1,400 titles. And there's many, many more ways it became very complicated. This is one place where the internet made this uh, project very, very complicated. It used to be when you'd make a recording, you'd have 10 or 15 titles and it'd all be in one place. So you'd simply follow that recording in its various uses. So it might get sold at a music store, it might get sold at a PX, it might get sold a mail order sort of thing. You're following those tunes. Now with the internet, every single one of those titles is a recording. So now you're following, in our case, we're following 1400 recordings instead of where we started, four pieces on one disc. 
So it's changed the nature. It's made it uh, very difficult to follow. And there are rights organizations keep popping up that have figured out how to help find those because obviously to their advantage, if they, they can figure it out, they can take a piece of it on its way by. But there are organizations now that follow um, various, um, there's something like 60 or 70 play, uh, um, internet sources for music like Spotify and Apple, but then it goes way beyond that. There, there's internet uh, programming all over the world and uh, they're able to gradually find all these and then account for royalties and so forth. But so it's, it's, it's yeah. become a big business. So at one point, a, a performer would receive a lot of income when people would actually buy the album or buy the CD. Mm -hmm. Now it's mm -hmm. more my share of royalties from Apple because everyone who has Apple, every mm -hmm. time they click on my song, I get a tiny piece of Apple's revenues. Is that, mm -hmm. is that more the way it works now? It, it's true, but it's still the same. In, in the case of a, a recording, the recording company, of course, takes most of the money and then pays out royalties. So the artist would get paid. Uh, either a royalty or work made to hire kind of situation. And then the owner of the, the music would get paid. That's still the case. It's just we're splitting up a much smaller, instead of splitting up a $10 recording, we're splitting up a $1 recording. And then that gets down to the finites where on a single play, that'd be like one person buying that recording. That's where you hear about the, the 0 0.001 cent and so forth. So it takes a lot of plays to get to, you know, back to equaling the sale of a recording. Right. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of polling. <laughs> I'll keep these CPAs honest. They got to be watching. <laughs> okay. Cats and dogs, please wake up your owner. Arf, arf, meow. Okay. <laughs> polling question one Chuck Dollenbach plays A, the tuna. B, the violin, C, the tape recorder, or D, the tuba. <laughs> Not to be confused with tubby tuba. In the video, Dollenbach versus Tubby. <laughs> Famous okay. song, Tubby the Tuba. Tubby the Tuba, yeah. My kids love Tubby the Tuba. Indeed. Okay, I'm going to do polling question number exactly. two. Okay. Get these done. <laughs> Chuck Dollenbach plays in the band the Chilean bass, the American sass, the Armenian glass, Josh, good job, or finally, the Canadian brass. I know everybody's going to need a long time to think about that one. <laughs> All right, so we're back here. Chuck, before I forget, I, I know uh, here's what I see a lot of, and I know you see a lot of it too. You see very talented students who want to be performers, and they have a great experience in middle school and high school, and they become convinced that they can be successful performers. After all, it must be pretty easy. Dollenbach did it. <laughs> right. So then they announce to their family that they're not going to go to college, or if they go to college, they're only going to study music or performance, and they need to go to NYU or USC is that, or Juilliard, because that's the only place they can go. And then four years later, they're waiting tables, and the, and the dream didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. what, what are, what's your words of wisdom when you... <laughs> You know, because I'm sure everywhere you go, somebody says, well, my son, my daughter, this, my son, yeah. my daughter, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The main problem is, and perhaps this is universal, not just music, not just certainly not just an instrument, is the expertise that it takes to be successful is sky high. The amount of time behind a performance is astronomical. Um, instrumentalists like us will look in their past and they'll say, maybe you practiced one hour every day. A pianist probably eight or nine hours a day, literally eight or nine hours a day 
to get to the point where they now have something that might be marketable <clears throat> that so far has nothing to do with taking that music any place other than your performance ability. So it's a tremendous amount of time and it means that generally musicians are not thinking about that next step. How do I actually get out in front of an audience? How do I make a career? A lot of the schools used to just leave a student on their own and the student had the idea that I will be found. <clears throat> Somebody will pick me out. I'll win a contest. Excuse me. <clears throat> Somehow I will be found to be a great musician. Well, that worked a little bit because you always have a Glenn Gould or a, an Elton John. You always have somebody that can uh, be picked out. But how about all the rest of us? How about the ones that need to find that for ourselves or make that career? And my advice always was don't ever let a student wait for the phone to ring or a message to come through that they are being hired for this job or that job. If while you're waiting, you should be doing something creative on your own, you know, get out there and do something. And I know that from our point of view, it was always small steps. Don't don't decide that there's there's nothing between all the perform practicing I did. There's nothing between that and being on the Carnegie Hall stage. That there's a tremendous amount of activity that can take place that all helps you get to a goal, a goal of performing, a goal of getting out in front uh, in front of audiences. And I think that the, uh, the fact is that you need to be overprepared. You need to have spent that time to be able to take advantage of any opportunity. And one of the things I know we grew up, back in the day, we grew up with this idea that be prepared, opportunity knocks once. And what became real apparent to us as a group and should be apparent to everybody now is opportunity is always in front of you. At any instant, somebody can have an idea that's just a game winner. It, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be any time. This opportunity idea is, is omnipresent. But you need to be prepared for that moment. And that's where the preparedness and, and I would say being over prepared you want to be able to to have your 100% of your ability so high that you can be playing or working at an 80% level and it's still fantastic. You definitely don't want to have your 100% be the minimum. You don't want that to be the deciding line between success and not success. Because then all these other things come in. There's courses now on, on overcoming fear and anxiety. A lot of these are based on people going out and doing something they're not really quite prepared to do. If you can get so far ahead of that that you can be calm in a moment when everybody else would take it as as uh, uh, maybe one of the most difficult moments in their life, that, that'll often be the difference. I have my own personal story on that. So we played, started playing Germany in 1980. And I have a Swiss... German heritage, but no language. It was a little embarrassing to have a name that looked like I should be able to speak a little German, playing in Germany and not speaking any German. So I took it on myself to learn German. And I wanted to get to the point where I could speak German from stage without having to memorize speeches and so forth. I wanted to be able to do it extemporaneously. So I worked very hard on that and I got to the point where I can stand on stage and talk. And I can do it well enough, and I don't look nervous doing it because it's my own words. I can make these, uh, it's not a conversation. I don't have to be attentive to have the right response. It's me saying what I need to say. So invariably after concerts in Germany, someone will come up to me and start talking German. And I have to say, wait a minute, what you heard on stage, that's my peak performance, that's it. <laughs> and because I don't look, because I don't look nervous doing it, people think it's a stage act that I'm trying to sound American German. Oh, I have to. <laughs> but it was something I just felt I needed for our performance. A lot of our performance is based on, we even talk to the audience as you well know. So that was missing 
we would have been missing in Germany if we couldn't have gotten to that point, I felt. So that's, uh, that, there's a case where I'm working at 100% efficiency. Fortunately, I don't look nervous doing it. And I'll, I also often get uh, audience to help me out when I get stuck with a language, I'll ask them to give me the word and uh, we can, and that's, that can be fun too. That becomes part of the process. Are you, so are you able to use all your humor on a German stage in German? And is it the same type of response as you get in the United States and other countries? Well, I told my, we had, we had a uh, promoter, well-known promoter in Germany and got to know him really well. So I thought I could finally tell him my only German joke I could do in German. <laughs> he was not amused. And uh, the joke is, what is the thinnest book in the world? The absolute thinnest. 1,000 years of German humor. <laughs> he was not amused. So I never actually told that joke uh, on stage in Germany. But uh, one of the things was reaching out, what, what, what is funny? What, what will be funny to German? Because uh, as, as people well know, Germans are very, take things very literal. And uh, consequently, it's it's sometimes difficult because a lot of our North American humor is just making fun of the opposites, and the uh, the German thought process doesn't take you to that opposite so quickly. So uh, one thing I did have fun with, and it's right, it's perfect for for business people listening in. So in uh, Germany, uh, banks are called Sparkasse, Sparen is to save. So if you're going to save money, Sparen is the monat, Sparen. So we were playing uh, the um, America variations that has God save the queen in it. So I was introducing, I said in English, it's God save the queen, but in German, it's Gott sparen sie die Königin. But they have two different words for saving and saving money and saving a situation. So it was, translates as God put the queen in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> so that worked, that worked nicely. So looking for that kind of thing is, is fun. And then, but I should point out, it's really important for people to know that the reason that we talk to the audience um, we inherited a recital format from the 50s and the 60s, I suppose. We inherited a recital format where an artist would come out on stage, take a bow, play their piece, take a bow, and leave. And if the audience didn't like it, the, uh, the artist would say, well, that must not be a very smart audience. They didn't love my great performance. And we took it from the other side. If if we came out and did something and the audience didn't enjoy it, we have a problem. We need to revisit our presentation, how we're taking that forward. And the revolutionary moment for me was early on, we all came out on stage and our trumpet player at the time, Fred Mills, had a little piccolo trumpet in his hand. Piccolo trumpet is half the size. You know, a trumpet is four and a half feet long, a regular trumpet. So a piccolo trumpet is two and a quarter feet long. And by the way, in Canada, it's even shorter because we have a metric system. But nevertheless, <laughs> the piccolo, I could see the audience's eyes. It was real obvious to see an audience. And they're all watching Fred. And you could hear them thinking, what is that instrument? So I thought, well, I could see that going on. I just went to the microphone and I told them what it was. We talked about the piccolo. So they didn't have to wonder through the whole piece what that is. They could actually listen to the music. So that kind of set us on a course of action of a lot of what we're doing. Why not make it uh, more interesting, like what I told you about working with kids, why not make it more interesting right up front so that you get a little signposts what to listen for. And if you can do it in a, in a way that's charming or interesting or funny or self-deprecating, for example, Takata and Fugue, a very important work by Bach. 
notes flying everywhere. Trumpet players are going crazy, following one another. And, uh, and I, I point out that they follow each other, triplet notes, 16th notes, 24th notes, which don't exist, by the way, 32nd notes. And just when you think they couldn't possibly do another one of these amazing feats on their trumpets, they stop. <laughs> That's when the, the fugue of the piece begins. The fugue is everybody has the same melody, which is, makes it equal for everybody playing. And the high point of the entire work is when, uh, of course, when I come in with the melody. So, okay, so what I'm basically doing for an audience is telling them what to listen for, that you're hearing this virtuosity and this complexity of the notes and that. So I guess looking backwards, I, I wish we were that smart at the time, but looking backwards, we know that, that learning is more successful in a positive, in a, in a positive framework. We know that, you know, this is a very basic psychology. We weren't really thinking that. We were just thinking of how do we bring an audience into what we're doing? How do we make them aware of what we're doing? And I think it's probably the same in, in your business, Alan. You know, when, when we've talked about business matters, you don't just give me an answer. You just don't say, okay, I've looked at this for a week and here it is, go away. You say, okay, let's take a look. This leads to that, to that, and that. You did this right. This could have been done better. Next time we'll do that. And you can really analyze it and you bring the person into your work. Without that, you don't have a relationship and you probably don't have a continuing relationship. And that's to develop any business, any business, you need a continuing floor to what you're doing. And I think that's that was always what we did, which any good business person would do, any any thoughtful person on any kind of board. You just want to bring people along with you so that you can the next time you work on something you've already got that as your basis you can go on to the next step you can go to the next step without that you're always starting over and of course leads leads to very little right well, let's talk about the humor a little bit because i, I think you are there there's no doubt in anyone's mind that you you could be a stand-up comedian <laughs> I mean, not oh, only are you on stage, your timing is really good, and then in person, you're just a funny guy. <laughs> did that did that just come naturally? And 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 I find that humor works well in business. That when I'm talking to someone, then it is a tense situation, or I'm getting trying yeah. to get to, to yeah. someone, or I need I need to tease somebody about something because I yeah. don't want to criticize them, but I'm able to tease them. Can you talk about how you use sure. Sure. humor? Yeah, very much so. I I, I think that the uh... The idea of humor, from our standpoint, um, I'm going to frame this just right because I don't want it to sound disrespectful. But when we met with lawyers, and we had really big lead lawyers, we talked about Elton John. We had the same lawyer as uh, Rush, and uh, you know a lot of these big pop groups in New York. So we had to do a lot of catching up to figure out how the business part actually worked. Because I don't think many classical music musicians are lucky enough to get to that point where you even are sitting with lawyers on a constant basis. So we were very lucky on the one hand, but we did have a lot to do. And uh, Gene Watts and I, we had, Gene Watts feet were about a foot off the floor, very creative. And it was a good relationship because I could write down what he was trying to say. I could finish his sentences and I could keep us in a business thing. But it made it, and we were told many, many times, it made it very interesting for people in business working with us. Because it seemed like, on the one hand, we took nothing seriously. But we were listening, and I think they were always surprised that at the end of the day, we were totally connected and totally listening. But it was disarming, and it made people feel like they really had, uh, like in a negotiation, everybody felt like they had the opportunity to take advantage of us because we were so offhanded and we're having fun with all these business meetings. But on the other hand, we were listening and we had, I think we had really reasonable negotiations, but also one of our principles was we were never trying to win. We were never hoping somebody would win and somebody would lose. We were always hoping we'd come to something that people went away feeling like they were getting a good end of a bargain, just as we would be going away thinking we got a good end of a bargain. And, and we never, we never, um, in fact, this was something that, that uh, Gene brought to the group. And I don't know where he got this idea, uh, but it was an excellent one, which was 
the the idea of any kind of negotiation would be finding out what was interesting the other party, what they needed, where they needed to end up, what did they need out of this relationship, and then how could we fit into that? How could we alter or pound into this situation so that they're really excited to work with us? And one of the things that we found very early on is it's really important that the people we were working with found success, even financial success. We didn't want such a good deal that they lost money, for example. That if they had success in different ways, plus financial success, then they'd want to work with us again. So we even had a situation, I remember one very specific one, we did a major concert with a lot of extra artists, it was an expensive production. And we did it in Toronto, Hamilton and Kitchener. These are three major halls up here in Canada. And two of them were full houses, fantastic reception. And the third one was probably a 60% house. And I think the break even for that fellow was 70 or 75% or something. So uh, we found out the result of that third one. We said, well, we've been really lucky on two of these. Let's make sure this guy doesn't lose. So we brought him up to break even. Nice. Consequently, he brought us back a year later. Imagine his feeling if he felt like, oh boy, Canadian brass, I took a little bit of a, I lost a little money last year. I don't think I want to book them back. No, we had a really nice relationship and then that continued throughout our career. That particular sponsor didn't mind negotiating with us anytime. He, he, he put whatever was fair and he knew it was going to work out. He just developed that confidence. And that kind of word gets around too, the way you treat people. Uh, word of mouth is still, okay, internet, uh, letters, UK, whatever. Word of mouth is still the most important. Uh, getting back to advice for young players, hone your skill, put something together that's fun or interesting or, or valuable or heart rending. Word of mouth, that will spread and the, the, the quickest way to that, you know, financial success, uh, emotional success, relationship success is is having a good uh, a good outcome that then leads to the next to the next to the next. Yeah, because we live in a world where a lot of the younger people don't have relationships. They want to do everything by texting and right. You know, I have done lawyers who say, I, I don't really ever want to meet a client or get to know a client. I just want to be in the background. And then you put them in a room with a client, and a few year, few hours later, they understand. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. They understand a little better. How does how does a musician, how how do you handle an introverted musician? Where 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 is it that they would go to start the word of mouth? <clears throat> well, there still is an excellence. There still is there is an unquantifiable ingredient that somebody can be so great at their profession that they have to be sought out. You can't ignore that. And maybe they have no social skill whatsoever. And I, th I think we see that every day, Some somebody that's really brilliant, but and maybe doing great things, but has certain aspects of their personality that put you off, but you still need that. You know? You see a lot of that in politics, but I won't even start there because uh, yeah. whew, it's going wild. And yeah. for musicians, it's really hard for musicians. There's so many. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, teaches at the uh, University of Arizona in Phoenix, and he showed me a three page document of words that he cannot use, he can no longer use. And that's really hard in a creative world because we often go down one path and then that's not so and then you go over here and you go over there and you're trying things out and it's fun and it's exciting and now we're starting to have to think of a lot of other things but there i am going into this and i will not because <laughs> and it's and it's often people of high profile that get caught called out or caught out accidentally because they are in the news or the press or whatever and it's, people are just waiting uh, we got in a little trouble for something we thought was there's a wonderful artist uh, that had a birthday and we put a little note saying happy birthday artist. I won't say who it is. 
not realizing that this artist had been accused of a uh, uh, inappropriate activity. So we got blasted as if we were supporting this person. And I thought, well, he's still a great artist. I will support his artistry. And I didn't realize he had gotten himself in trouble, but how can we be responsible? Anyway, you see how I just did? And, and suddenly well, you're having to... I, I will say there's a very vocal minority in these of one to four percent of people, no matter what you do, they're going to send you an email saying, how dare you say that? Right. The other 95% enjoyed it and got something out of it. And we are mm -hmm. human. We can't forget that we're human. And, you know? Well, I'll so, tell you something. We got, we got blasted for this, and you'll, you might find this interesting. We were playing a Christmas concert, and um, we listed on the program a set of three Jewish pieces to make it a season concert as well as a Christmas concert. And the concert, uh, we realized it had gotten too long. We had too many pieces, and the most appropriate thing to cut at that time were the three Jewish pieces. So we did. We played the concert, and it's on the program. We got a long letter from a university professor telling us that this was absolutely a mistake, terrible to cut the Jewish pieces. How dare we do this? And it was a very well-written letter. And unfortunately, it was blasting us for cutting the Jewish pieces. So I thought I'd better do some research. And I wrote back and I gave him all the titles and I said, are you aware that 60% of our Christmas concert was written by Jews? And I said, so you picked out the most obvious thing to blast us over because you saw it on a program and then we didn't play it. But you obviously didn't do your research to realize this. It was, you know, it was more Jewish than, than the non-Jewish writers. So there was a case where Right, the guy just took the obvious thing and blasted us without really doing the homework. So that one was benign. Fortunately, that nobody got hurt. But some of these things, you can, we're seeing guys get hurt. Yeah, it, uh, people uh, people take things. We we all take things a little bit too seriously nowadays, and we don't <laughs> give the, person the benefit of the doubt. Okay, let's do the last two polling questions here, <laughs> in case anyone would want to leave early. Josh, you ready? Okay, polling question number three. The tuba <laughs> is A, a woodwind instrument, B, a string instrument, C, a percussion instrument, or D, a brass instrument. Josh, <laughs> these are really difficult questions. I don't know where you came up with them. How you could expect this audience to get these questions right? Yeah. You know, I'm not a business person, but I think I see a pattern here, Alan. I, 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 I <laughs> okay, now here's polling question number four. And that is the brass has performed over 60 countries and recorded more than how many albums? 15, 35, 40, or 130? And I, I happen to know, I think the answer, is the answer actually 130, Chuck? Uh, it's over that now, yes. Oh my gosh. I mean, how, yeah. so that, is that, how many a year do you guys record? We were doing two a year from the very beginning. We were, we were fortunate, again, because of CBC, we did our first recording in, in our first year. And then we did two every year after that. And then we have CBC and RCA. And, um, uh, I think it was uh, Phillips that took us right into European recording. So we've been very fortunate to be able to record so much. I have a closing. Uh, Alan, you'd asked me for tips for brass players. You, you wanted 10. Uh, we don't have time to do it, but I came up with uh, more than 10. But nevertheless, there's well, one right. room for Chuck, we can, run, we can run over, so. No, no, there's just one that I need. I leave people with. It's really important. And it may be the same for meetings, but it's definitely for performers. And this is uh, something we make very clear when we do workshops in universities and so forth. There's one really important thing to consider when you're about to go out, approach an audience, you're in the lights. Never leave your wallet backstage. <laughs> very important. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> do you have 10 of them though? Uh, well, I I wrote down a whole bunch of, because 
I, I divided it up a little differently than you suggested. Um, um, because I don't really have specific tips, but I thought there were sort of four aspects to a career that that are sort of important. And one is the learning phase. That's when you take an instrument. And that's the interesting one. The first time you pick up an instrument and you just blow on it and it just responds. Now you start learning all the technical part of it and it becomes a process and you start thinking about the way you're holding the instrument, uh, how you're sitting, all these things get in the way. So you spend your whole life trying to get back to that first moment when you just hauled off and blew a note into an instrument. So that was the one thing. And then, so you're learning and that needs the quest, the quest for excellence. And the next was preparation. And that's where all these things that you're learning, now you're putting it into some kind of a concise area of uh, opportunity so that you can actually develop the skill so that's the second is preparing yourself and that's where all that time takes place that i mentioned these hours and hours of practice and then launching a career and i was feeling like everything you go through is necessary to get to the next step so it may feel like the whole world is against you or you're not being led into the society or you're not being given opportunities but all this is part of the learning process because that's going on all the time. You're just getting better at navigating those uh, hurdles as you're going along. So that's the, the launching of a career. Now we had a, a fellow in our group, Chris Cletty was a trumpet player and he'd come in every day and he'd just say, you know, this is the best day of my life. Every day. And I thought that gave him a, a certain feel. It was like a charisma, you, you were drawn to him. And if he'd come in and said, boy, what a terrible day I had yesterday, you'd immediately want to just kind of back away or just go over here and do your thing. And you might hear him out, see if you could help. But when you come in and say, this is the best day of my life, you thought, wow, this is the, this is the guy. He's the kind of guy in sports teams. You need one of these guys in your locker room to cheer everybody up. He's not down on everything. Okay, so we lost that or we didn't get that. Yeah, but man, was it fun doing it? And we were, you know, always looking for the positives. And that the fact in this phase of starting to launch your career, that, that really all the destiny concept is in your own hands, that everything is out there. And it's for you to find out where to find the keys to open the doors, find the people you need to meet, get the support you need. Uh, people often uh, wonder about our operation and, I drew up a list at one point of all the people that have been helpful in our career. It's an amazing career. And the idea of uh, um, all these things, people are saying that you need to be more generous in the kind of people you're working with, race, religion, so forth. When I put our list together, it is absolutely, it's, it's, it's international. It's, it's an amazing list. You don't see that on the stage. You know, five guys walk out or five guys and a girl walk out on stage that's us but you don't see this huge community and it's like you alan i know that you you hardly work a day in your life now right you have this huge community behind you doing all this work for you right we have this tremendous support system that we develop and it's really uh, nobody can take i don't think anybody can ever really take credit for even a composer tries to take credit for a great piece of music and you say well, where did that come when? And they says, well, I'm not sure. It just came to me. So, okay, well, it wasn't you then. Where did that come from? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then something that I'm thinking of because uh, uh, I'm not as young as the guys in my group is continuing what it is you're doing, your profession. And one of the main things is remembering why you started it in the first place. What drew you to this? What was it that was exciting or interesting? Um, there's a fellow that does a podcast, Galloway. He's a business a business teacher at, uh, I think it's Columbia. And he said, uh, it's quite a strong statement, something about, he said, all these people that come and tell you, uh, all these billionaires come and tell you how to be successful and follow your dream, he said. He said, that's nonsense. He says, <laughs> he says, develop your skill, develop your abilities, and that'll be exciting. 
the fact that you can fulfill that, that'll become your dream. That'll that'll be what you want to do. But behind that, it, you can't always just be pursuing a dream or you'll never get it. Get any, I'm paraphrasing from him, I'm going a little off of what he said, but it's basically that often these uh, words of wisdom from older people, you're talking to people that are very successful and might not even know exactly how they became successful. And they think, oh, I was just following my dream. No, they're probably following their intuition and their expertise more than a dream. It be, may become a dream or you look back at it and say, what a dream that was. And I know for me, the opportunity to, to continue doing what I'm doing is because I still love it. But I don't think I loved it as much when I started out, especially in the early years where you're, you're still putting those small tips. That's hard work. And you, you, those are kind of two different things. And the hard work was worth it because I didn't know where that would lead. It was just, you know, I guess that's fun or that's interesting. And the hard work was leading me to small successes. But looking back, I can't say, well, yeah, this is exactly what I expected. What a great career. And you look back and you say, well, that was hard work. I'm glad I did it. And I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad I can continue it. And it's remembering what drew you out in the first place. Uh, one of the examples for me is I remember playing basketball in the early years. Like you just throw a ball into a hoop probably on your garage. And they did that. And then pretty soon you're playing with other guys. That's really fun because you're relating to other people. And then... Uh, even in sixth grade, I remember the, the other kids would come and see a game and suddenly they're clapping and cheering and whistling and so forth. That made it even more exciting. So that was really drawing me this thing. And the, the fact that you could share that experience in a sense, or they're watching me do this, or I'm doing that and they like it. This is great. Well, that is a, that's, that's, that's a nice part of the whole process. And just like sports, music, any of these occupations is you're being observed, even if you're being observed by one person or 10 people or doing a podcast or whatever, is you're sharing that knowledge. And that is really exciting to get that feedback uh, back as well. So at any rate, the idea that you can continue a career like this, um, I'm, I'm certainly on the, the far end of my career. I've been, uh, I'm like, so I, I lived in Florida for a while. I remember Alan, I was down there. And I always loved these people my age and older out on the highways driving 90 miles an hour. They're right in there with a football player who just had three seasons and he's 25 years old and he's out there driving on the same roads. And I'm thinking, you know, we're pretty lucky in our professions that we can make this a life journey. I'd hate to think that the best years of my life were college or the best years of my life were those three years I got to play someplace. Like I'm more attuned to my colleague I mentioned where this is the best day of my life. I've been looking forward to coming and talking to you for for months. I mean, these are the things that are exciting. So how lucky can how lucky can we be if we're if we if we're looking forward? We're being here right now. In fact, there was a a book in the 70s, a great sage, and the name of the book was Be Here Now. And that's a mantra now. Is we're always worried about what's tomorrow. We got an appointment. We got to go see a dentist on Monday, and we got to do this work on Wednesday. And we got to do that. And then you remember all that. And I remember like I hit me two years ago, I hit me, and then I did that. And I hated that. No, how about right this instant? We're right here, right now. This is the best part. Anyhow, I digress. <laughs> Chuck, that was excellent, and I feel like we've only done part of the tip of the iceberg. Can, can we do a part two sometime? I'm here. Alan, I'd do anything for you. You're oh. one of these people I was talking about. You've been so supportive. I mean, way beyond. Um, and this, I think we all want to attract people somehow that do more than they should. More than certainly more than they're obligated to, way more than they should. And that's what props a person like me, a person like you. I mean, what the advice you've given me over the years and the, the time we've spent, it, you know, well, you knew I wouldn't be able to afford it. So I have to thank you for doing it. <laughs> no, Sorry, but, okay, one last thing about affording. So I, I was fortunate enough to get. Uh, the way it happened. So we were in the Hamilton plan and the people on the board of directors, the fellow was uh, owned a steel company and his wife 
uh, was on the Nuclear Commission of Canada and so forth, really important people. So they were our mentors back in the 1970s. Well, I got to meet their sons about that time, and I think they were in junior high when we were starting out. And one of the sons became a developer in Hamilton, and I got involved with him a few years ago. And it's the same sort of thing that just by the supporting of that family and then getting to know the family and then me supporting them in small ways. But he did say at one time, and it's funny you mentioned the name, he said, why couldn't you have had a few hit tunes like, you know, we could have, we could have, we could have, we could have been building skyscrapers. <laughs> yeah, it there would be <laughs> interesting to try a different instrument, huh? <laughs> right. So thanks, thanks for having me, Alan. I, I hope this has been. Yeah, and Chuck, what I'm going to do is we we have about 225 people, so I'm going to survey them and see what we want to hear next from you. Because okay. The world, according to Chuck Dahlenbach, is a great world. And and you're also a guy. And, and when, when you come back, especially for this audience, I want to talk about how Jolene, you have worked very effectively with Jolene and how, how, do you, how to use a CPA, what to ask. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you're, you're a very mathematical guy. I find a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of these systems are very mathematical. Yeah. But you, you, you think and through you're in it. You, you like have that MBA. You have the math going. You have the business relationships going. So I think we have a lot more to learn from you. And I, I always appreciate that. And I always appreciate that we can laugh together. That that makes life so nice. I have a book here. Uh, it's called This Business of Music, and it tells you how to support how to support somebody. It was our lawyer Peter Thal in New York. Uh, one of his claims to fame, he was one of the lawyers on the baseball strike years ago. Anyway, but he's a, a music guy. <clears throat> he wrote a book and it was, so your neighbor next door is a great singer and you want to get involved and you put in some money because you can be part of the process. <clears throat> and this guy's great. And he goes and he does some local stuff and he wins a couple of small awards on signed artists and everything's going great. Chapter three, chapter four. And then the heading of his title is when to pull the plug. <laughs> It's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So there's a big business component to all this too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Chuck, thanks again. Great to see you. Marcia says <laughs> thanks, hello. Al. All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> Charles Dellenbach on tuba, trumpeter Frederick Mills, David O'Hanian plays the French horn, another trumpeter, Ronald Rahm, and on trombone, Eugene Watts. Ladies and gentlemen, the Canadian brass. Good morning. Of our uh, proximity to the 40 seconds. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
successful radio talk show psychologist Jordan Donahue tomorrow morning at 9. From Hollywood, The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. This is Ed McMahon along with Doc Severinsen and the NBC Orchestra inviting you to join Johnny and his guests, Dom DeLuise, Brooke Shields, and the Canadian Press. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Hey, here's something you're really going to like. These are five gentlemen who have um, been appearing in concert around the country. They've received some great reviews, and I think you're really going to enjoy them. Would you welcome, please, the Canadian Brass. <laughs> this time like to perform Johann Sebastian Bach's most famous composition, his Fugue in G minor. This work was originally written for Bach's own use as a church organist, and in the kit that we got, there's a very clear indication that we should proceed directly to the end, which features a magnificent tuba solo. Guests hail from up north. Uh, their unique sound ranges from Bach to Dixieland. They're here to perform Beale Street Blues. Please welcome Canadian Brass.
Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. We'll be right back. Thanks for coming. Sounds great.